Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We're beginning a new unit on the non-proliferation regime, and we're starting with its most important component, the NPT, a treaty that has almost universal participation in the world. Let's get to it. Let's go back to 1960 and revisit a concern that we've talked about before. At this point, the United States had nuclear weapons, the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons, the United Kingdom had nuclear weapons, and France had just tested a nuclear weapon. Meanwhile, China would soon test a nuclear weapon. There were concerns worldwide that this was just going to explode. Kennedy addressed this directly in one of his debates with Richard Nixon, saying that there are indications that because of new inventions, that 10, 15, or 20 nations will have a nuclear capacity by 1964. We know that that's not actually what happened. By 1964, only five countries would have nuclear weapons, and it would take us all the way until after the turn of the millennium until we had our 10th. The 15th and 20th are nowhere on the radar currently either. Nevertheless, this was a serious worldwide concern and a frequent topic of discussion at the United Nations. What could the world community do to try to reduce the spread of nuclear weapons? In 1961, a committee formed to answer that question. The solution became to create a treaty, and so negotiations on such a treaty began in 1965. Three years later, we had the Non-Proliferation Treaty written down and opened for signature, and two years after that, it began to be enforced. The treaty itself has three pillars. The first is non-proliferation. That one's obvious. It's the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, after all, so signatories are not allowed to develop nuclear weapons if they signed the treaty. The second pillar is a reaffirmation of the right of states that are complying with the treaty to have free and open access to peaceful civilian uses of nuclear technology. The most important of these, of course, is nuclear power, but it also extends to pharmaceuticals, agriculture, space exploration, and a whole bunch of other things. Combined together, these first two pillars are why the Non-Proliferation Treaty is sometimes described as a grand bargain. In return for not developing nuclear weapons, not only do you have the right to access civilian nuclear technology, but countries that are more advanced in those topics will assist you as a way of saying thanks for not creating more nuclear weapons. The final pillar is disarmament. That might strike you as a little bit strange. This is the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and the first part of it is that if you've signed the treaty, you're not supposed to develop nuclear weapons. So how can signatories contribute to disarmament if they themselves don't have nuclear weapons? Here's the thing. Three countries had nuclear weapons at the time that the Non-Proliferation Treaty was created. The United States, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, France, and China. And they're given a special status in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Remember that these are the recognized nuclear powers. And by the terms of the treaty, they are allowed to be a part of it, despite the fact that they have nuclear weapons. Their contribution to the treaty, then, is to engage in a good faith effort to reduce their nuclear stockpiles with the ultimate goal of complete disarmament. As I said at the top, the Non-Proliferation Treaty is one of the most popular treaties out there, at least in terms of its membership. Almost every single country has signed the treaty. The last holdout was Cuba in 2002. A couple of other countries have signed the treaty since then, but they weren't really holding out. They're new countries to the world, and they signed very shortly after they were formed. In fact, we can count the non-members on our fingers. Three of them are Israel, India, and Pakistan. What do these guys have in common? Well, they're all nuclear powers, and they never signed the treaty. The central complaint here is that the Non-Proliferation Treaty establishes a hierarchy of haves and have-nots. The U.S., the Soviet Union, United Kingdom, France, and China, they are allowed to have nuclear weapons as recognized powers. The rest of them are not. 
India in particular points out that it's a bit of a strange decision rule that if you had nuclear weapons before 1970, that you should be legally allowed to have them. And India, because they did not have nuclear weapons in 1970, is not legally allowed to have nuclear weapons, at least according to the treaty. Another non-member is North Korea, and there's a little more intrigue here. North Korea was once a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. However, the Non-Proliferation Treaty contains an escape clause. If you provide a 90-day notice, you are allowed to leave the treaty, and the law no longer applies to you. North Korea did just that in 2003, and would go on to test a nuclear weapon a few years later. Another non-member is South Sudan. There's not much of an interesting story here, though. It's a new country, and it doesn't belong to a lot of treaty organizations. It's not that South Sudan disagrees with the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's just busy trying to create its country at home and not yet participating in a lot of international organizations. Taiwan, on the other hand, is an interesting story. Recall that the treaty opened for signature in 1968 and started fully in 1970. At the time, Taiwan represented China within the United Nations. It wasn't until 1971 that mainland China took over representation within the UN. As a result, Taiwan is no longer a member of the treaty, although they essentially comply with it in a bit of a side system. Summing up, the treaty is very popular in terms of its membership, and the only countries that are not a part of it are the ones that I just spoke of. But like any other piece of international law, there is an inherent enforcement problem with the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Imagine that you broke a domestic law inside of the United States. What happens next? Well, the aggrieved party can contact the authorities, and eventually the justice system will sort it out. And the fact that there are courts and an enforcement mechanism deters you from committing crimes in the first place. The same is not true on the world stage. With apologies to the United Nations, there is no world police that's going to come and arrest you if you violate an international law. You don't see someone in blue helmets knocking on the doors of the White House whenever the United States breaks from one of its treaty commitments. And every now and then, we do observe violations of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Iraq, Syria, and Libya were all members of the NPT as they worked to develop nuclear weapons. That's clearly in violation of that first principle on non-proliferation. Nevertheless, we do observe compliance with the non-proliferation treaty the vast majority of the time, despite that enforcement problem. One of the major reasons is because of that grand bargain that we talked about at the beginning of this lecture. Let's rewind and review how nuclear negotiations work more broadly. Opponents of potential proliferators look into the future and think about how negotiations would play out once a potential proliferator has acquired a nuclear arsenal. The dashed line represents the division of the good at stake. To entice the potential proliferator not to develop nuclear weapons, the opponent can offer concessions in the present commensurate with what that future distribution would look like. The opponent can do a little bit better than that, though, because the potential proliferator by accepting this agreement, doesn't have to pay the cost to develop a nuclear weapon. As a result, the opponent and the potential proliferator are ultimately better off. We have a deal that looks like what the potential proliferator would receive if the potential proliferator were to develop nuclear weapons, but no inefficiency is coming from the cost of developing nuclear weapons or any of the externalities that would come from those nuclear weapons. As such, one perspective on the Non-Proliferation Treaty is that the signature itself is not worth very much. Instead, the signature is reflecting successful negotiations between countries and would-be proliferators. In other words, those would-be proliferators are not developing nuclear weapons because they signed their name on a dotted line, 
but rather because they are happy with the assistance that they're getting on their nuclear power plants, or the additional military help that they're getting for their conventional forces, or the concessions they're receiving on some sort of policy that they have in dispute with another country. The fact that states strategically select into signing the non-proliferation treaty, perhaps based on what type of negotiated settlements they're getting outside of the treaty, makes it difficult to try to estimate what's going on with the causal effect of signature. Trying to control for that sort of thing is difficult empirically. But to the best of our abilities, it does appear that signing the non-proliferation treaty does have a causal effect to reduce the probability of proliferation. It's not much, but it's something. And on a topic as serious as non-proliferation, we'll take something over nothing. One of the reasons that it might work to some degree is an argument that's common to international law more generally. If you sign the non-proliferation treaty, you're probably going to have to rearrange domestic law to make it illegal to develop nuclear weapons. And if you do that, then undoing it later just adds an extra step of difficulty. Thus, a small subset of countries might have pursued nuclear weapons if it had not been for signing the treaty 10 or 20 years earlier. And indeed, the treaty is popular among its signatories. When the treaty began in 1970, it had a fixed 25-year duration. At a 1995 review conference, however, that duration was extended indefinitely. And so now the non-proliferation treaty just persists year after year. That being said, there are some concerns within the treaty, the biggest of which being the disarmament pillar. It is true that the number of nuclear weapons worldwide has declined over time. However, it's not really the commitment to disarmament and a good faith effort to engage in it that's driving that behavior. Instead, the real issue here is that nuclear weapons are expensive to maintain. And when you're no longer in the peak of the Cold War, spending all of that money to keep those nuclear weapons running is no longer worthwhile. As a result, the deeper critics of the Non-Proliferation Treaty have gone a step further to press for that disarmament pillar. One such step is the creation of various nuclear weapons free zones. In these zones, you're not allowed to develop nuclear weapons yourselves, you can't have nuclear weapons from other countries deployed in these areas, and you can't even have nuclear weapons within ships be docked in these countries. You can see that these treaties are largely regional. There's one for Latin America, there's one for Africa, there's one for Central Asia, and there's one for Southeast Asia. And then my favorite fact about this is that Mongolia up there is not actually in a treaty with the Central Asian countries. Mongolia is a nuclear weapons free zone all by itself. Aside from those, there are also treaties that have broader compliance about other areas, including Antarctica, that's a nuclear weapons free zone, space, another nuclear weapons free zone, and even the seabed. So no nuclear weapons can be stationed on the wreck of the Titanic. The other step has been to work on a treaty like the NPT, but one that does not contain the special exemption for those five recognized states. Work on this began in the 2010s, with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons being signed in 2017. You can see here that membership closely follows those nuclear weapons free zones from a moment ago. Countries in red are full-fledged members of the treaty. Not only have they signed it, they've also ratified it. Countries in blue have signed the treaty, but have not yet ratified it. But they do have some time there because the treaty itself will not begin until 2021. That wraps up this lecture on the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Like I said, it's the central piece of international law that governs the non-proliferation regime. We'll have a lot more to learn about that non-proliferation regime in future lectures. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.